Oh, I'm right in fight. Damn, dog! That hog just came to me! <laughs> 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 that hog just came to me! That hog just came to me! Beat me on the leg! Did it not hurt you? You can't even cut my leg right here! That's it. I have officially been cut by a boar hog. Look at him cut me in the leg. I can't you hog that like a lion after, honey. You, you got to do what you gotta do. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast today, guys. By popular request, I have caught up to an exceptional man <laughs> that is known far and wide on YouTube by the handle Deer Meat for Dinner. Yes, sir. As they all say, Deer Meat. <laughs> that's, that's what they call you, Deer oh, yeah, Meat. Man, I'll be out on the <laughs> river or driving down the truck, honk, honk, Deer Meat. All Everyone, right, man. Yeah, vegans yelling, Deer Meat. You know? <laughs> Do you have any trouble with the vegans online? None. Sometimes they, uh, sometimes None. the vegans can be a little bit uh, aggressive. Yeah. No, I have, I have one video. It was actually the fifth video I ever made, skinning a gator, and uh, it gets a little bit of hate, but I, the hate goes away. It doesn't. It doesn't percolate. It just someone will whoa, blow up and get all angry, and then it just goes away because. We have a real culture yeah. of respect on my channel. I was going to say that, man. You've got an army. You've got 844,000 subscribers. And these guys, girls, people, are, uh, are big fans. I mean, you have, you have created uh, an army of, of supporters. Yeah, and a lot, you know, I have a lot of friends that YouTube and are in this industry. Um, I call it an industry. It's a life for me, but it is an industry because we make a living at it. Right. But... Um, Everyone's always worried about getting more views and getting more subscribers. If, if you ever watch my videos, I never really tell people, hey, subscribe. I do thank them for sharing my, my videos and whatnot. I thank them for the support and the encouragement that they give us. But I'm happy for everyone that I have now. I'm really like if I just stopped, if I stopped gaining subscribers and just kept what I have right now, I'd be very blessed and very happy. So I try to be very content with what I have. And when I'm, you know, when you're content with something, it's very good to you. It feels good to you. You know, if you're not content with it and you're always tr wanting more, wanting more, wanting more, then it's never, it really is never fulfilling. So I tell everyone, hey, they're like, you're almost to a million. I'm like, yeah, but look, I just passed 800,000. I'm so happy just to be here. Right. And I, I'm always thinking, well, that's you know, what am I going to do? What's my next video like right now? Only thing I'm worried about is hanging out and talking with you. I've I've watched your stuff for a long time. Uh, thank you so much for your your kind words towards me. But well, that's very nice. I, I've watched you guys. I think your your format with Saltwater Experience and and Into the Blue and those those shows really intimate, very 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 well produced, which uh, not all outdoor shows are. No, you are amongst no. well, the very best. That's also very kind of you to say. Um, one of the things that I have, uh, when when we got such an overwhelming response, I asked everybody who they'd want to see me interview, and uh, got a whole slew of list of names. And I have been keeping a list of names ever since I th started doing this project of people that I admire, people that I respect, people that I think are cool, people that I don't know, people that I think I could learn something from. And that's really what this is all about. I like to learn. I've got what I call a white belt mentality. I feel like no matter how long I've been doing this, I feel like I could learn from somebody that just got started yesterday. I feel like there's always something to learn. And so when I start looking at your stuff, one of the things that resonated with me right away, two things actually, one, family. Two is that you, uh, you carry yourself with gratitude. Like you, you, you say that a lot, man feel great to be out here. I'm, I'm so thankful for this. I'm so thankful for that. How does that happen for you? Do, is that a conscious thing that you have gratitude for where you are? Um, I, it, I believe it has a lot to do with how you're brought up and what you're brought up doing and 
that we were brought up with manners. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. And uh, as a kid, heck, I'd have been perfectly content with a bucket of dead shrimp and a cane pole <laughs> on that dock. <clears throat> yeah. I'd figure out how many sheep's head were around each pole and how many mangrove snappers were there. And if they weren't biting, I'd catch a hardhead catfish. It didn't matter. To, and I say this on my channel all the time. It's about getting the bite. So I love blue marlin fishing and daytime sword fishing and tarpon fishing. But it doesn't matter if I'm catching a, a cichlid on a beetle spin or a blue marlin in Costa Rica. It, you've got to figure out how to get the bite, you know, and how do you get that bite? That, that to me is awesome. And so no matter where I am or what I'm doing, I'm really excited to be there. There's millions and billions of people all over the earth that never get to spend a day doing what I do. I know the vast majority of my subscribers, unfortunately, won't get to do the things that I do. And I, I'm getting to make a living doing it. So you know what? Every single day I wake up in the morning, I say my prayers, I say, Lord, thank you for today. And thank you for the opportunities that you give me. And I'm going to make the best of it today. I never worry about tomorrow. I only worry about what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. And um, wh when you live like that, and when you when you when you are thankful for what you have, you appreciate what you have, and it all means more. And it all, you know, you're able just to appreciate it. And and I appreciate you saying that. But that is, to me, that's so big. It's just to appreciate what you have and be thankful for what you have. Well, that was a, I, I consider it to be a big shift in my life when I came across that, um, that concept of purposefully living with gratitude, being thankful for every breath you're taking, being thankful for every step you're taking. And this one, um, guy told me this, this little thing that he does every morning. And I started, to, I started bringing it into my life and it was, you step out of bed, the first foot hits the ground. You say, thank second foot hits the ground. You say, you thank you, thank you thank you all the way to the bathroom to brush your teeth or whatever you're doing. And man, I started that a long time ago. And it, ha what it does is it sets you at, at a place for the day that you are grateful for. You're grateful for that step. You're grateful for just waking up. And I, I don't know, it has been profound in my life. And I love to see it with others that, that just, they're not taking anything for, for granted. And, and often People that live lives like you do or like I do, you get a lot of opportunities to go outside. You may, you know, they say uh, familiarity breeds contempt. You know, if, if it's too familiar, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. If, if, if the fish is too plentiful, nah, I don't like that fish anymore. You know, so the, to stay grateful and thankful for every opportunity, I think, is, is, is really good. And I think it's a huge, great message that you're putting out to, uh, to your audience. Well, I appreciate it. So Bonita, Bonitas do breed contempt in me, though, <laughs> <laughs> because they are absolutely too plentiful. But uh, you, you know, you could say that if you went up to the Northeast, that they are they are the most prized species. You know, I know. I, I know you did a video with with Josh uh, Jorgensen yeah. for a, a podcast with him, and when you were you were talking about that, I was thinking, goodness gracious, Josh and the Bonitas, we go fishing. He's like, man, look at them, and I'm like, oh, he he talked about it. Gracious. He talked about it on for for a long time about. About, about the difference between Northeast and down here. Yeah. And if those people came down here, they wouldn't yeah. believe what was going on. And, and, and these people down here just, you know, he had an interesting uh, idea that I never really heard is that people don't like the most available, like whatever's the most available, you know, whether that's Jack Cravel's, Bonita's, Barracuda's, whatever. But that's an interesting thing that happens. But I think if you're living, living with gratitude, um, you can, you can have one slip of a Bonita. Nah, don't like this. You, you, you're, you're allowed, you're allowed one, one fish that you don't like. Right, well, right, let's right. talk about the way that you grew up because you're saying you grew up with manners. You grew up, you, you're, you're a self-proclaimed Florida cracker, right? hundred percent cracker to the bone. So tell me what a cracker is in, All right. in, from a, from a cracker. What is, because, because a lot of people that live outside of Florida have another idea what a cracker is. Tell me what what a f true Florida cracker considers a, a cracker. Okay. True Florida crackers just in a, well, we'll back up and I'll, and I'll tell this really quick because we don't have four hours to do this. <laughs> back up to uh, Ponce de Leon when he came to Florida looking for, or came to the Americas looking for the Fountain of Youth. They brought a couple ships, 500 cows, 500 horses, 
They were Andalusian cattle and uh, small, really tough, could deal with anything. They offloaded over in Port Charlotte. Uh, as they offloaded, were getting set up. They got ambushed by Indians, uh, Native Americans. He was actually shot in the calf by an arrow, by a poison arrow. They left the cattle, left the horses, jumped back on the ships and headed to Cuba. That's where uh, Ponce de Leon died, was in Cuba. So all his cracker, all his Andalusian cattle, Andalusian, Andalusian horses went wild. And I mean, the, think about what Florida looked like yeah. before anyone was here. You looked know, like other your than ranch, that, basically, right? Yeah, it looked <laughs> like my ranch with mosquitoes the size of ospreys. <laughs> and um, so all the all the cattle started breeding, becoming wild. Well, then you know the the U.S. government was like, okay, here's the deal: whoever wants to go down there and just uh, tame that land go for it. Well, when they came down and found all the wild cows and wild horses, uh, they started setting up huge land tracks. And I mean, there's huge land barons in Florida to this day that originated then, but they didn't have the manpower to, to do it. So then they reached out to anyone. Hey, anyone who wants to come down here, we'll give you a little, little homestead. We'll give you some land and you come down and hunt these cows. That's why cattlemen in Florida are, will never be known as cowboys. They're always cow hunters because mm. that's how we originated as cow hunters hunting the cracker cows and the cracker okay. horses. So they came down and were just tough, tough men. And we really utilized a cow whip. Most places they call it a bull whip. In Florida, it's a cow whip used by a cow hunter. And if you imagine working cows, it's going to be brutally hot, mosquitoes, just really tough, and it's so thick. So if I'm pushing my cattle here, if I'm working around this cypress head here, and three of my buddies or two of my buddies are over there, I don't, I can't, I don't have a cell phone, so I can't text them. Right. And so you're constantly, pow, working that, you know, dow, like a really good cow hunter. It's just, it's just amazing how they can just, dow, just throw it, dow, and they'll, you know, as you're working your cow, as you're working your, your cows and riding your horse, they'll drag that, they'll drag their whip in and bow, huh. bow. Well, your friends can associate with where you are. They know, oh, he's there. We'll push around this way. We'll catch up with him there. I believe a lot of it had to do with mosquitoes also, you know what I mean? <laughs> bow. And, um, but then as you're bringing the cattle in, you'd hear the, you'd hear the moos of the cows, but all the women, you could hear that cracking sound for miles away coming, and they would know, here come the crackers, because hmm. they were known by the sound of the cracking of their whip. Well, then they'd start gathering up some cornbread or whatever meat was available, maybe stewing some some swamp cabbage, making mm -hmm. sure that was good and hot, have meals ready, because guys would get in, they want to get some food, back on the, you know, back on the trail working. There wasn't a lot of time to lollygag. And so that's where cracker came from, and that was... That was hard, hard work, and it oh. was very respected work. And so to, to be the son of a cracker or the grandson of a true cracker, my, my grandpa, all he did was cut lighter knot fence posts for a nickel apiece and, and cow hunt. That's what he did. That's what my mom grew up, grew up doing, trapping otters and coons and possums and gators and whatnot, you know? Yeah. And so to, to have that heritage and have that lineage is it's a badge of honor to me. So how much time did you get to spend with your grandfather? That tons, had, tons, really? tons, tons. Yeah. I, um, he passed away. Uh, he passed away about five years ago. And I, from as soon wow. as. Wow. So wait a minute. Five years ago. He was when born was he March born? March 11th, 1921. So in 1921, mm -hmm. that, well, it would be later, I guess, when, when he's actually working and doing all of that. But so by the he's time, probably 25 years old doing oh, that, no. right? 11, 12, 13 oh. years old. Yeah, he had, had no education. You Once you're old enough to ride a horse and crack a whip, yeah, that's, what that's you, it. He had no education whatsoever. His education was far beyond books yeah, and, yeah. and writing. Well, it, the natural world. And then he... You spend time with him, and he shows you oh, how man. to work the land. He shows you how to do the things that you're doing on your videos. Because <laughs> I'm looking at these videos, and, man, you're cutting off hog balls, and you're, <laughs> and you're making swamp cabbage, and yeah. you're trapping stuff, and you're, 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 you're taking everything, and you're, you're creating a meal out of it, and you're living off the land as, uh, as other people did with, with, the, with the comforts of a stove and, and mm -hmm. stewed tomatoes and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. But you're doing this in a way that 
you're cooking everything from toad fish and and uh, and 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 puffers to you know hogs and deer and and I mean I hadn't seen you eat a possum but you could trap them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's all knowledge that comes from your grandfather. Because when I'm watching this, I'm like. How old can this guy possibly be? I mean, how old are you? I'm 41. So 41. I'm a little ahead of you. But and and I have gathered some skills in my time, but I'm I'm quite impressed with with the the breadth of environmental knowledge that you have and how you're skinning a gator one day, you're 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 caping a hog the next day, you're spearfishing the next day, you're doing all of these things. And I'm thinking, how has this guy developed these skills in 41 years? And that all what you're saying now is that all came from your grandfather. Is that right? No, sir. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what came from my grandpa is And there's more. Yeah, well, no, what came from my grandpa is the ability to do your best today. He didn't, only thing in the world he knew was the Bible and the back of a horse and treat your family like they're everything. Treat your friends with respect and to do your best today. And so, you know, he showed me some things like we skinned, uh, skinned some soft shell turtles together and, and cut some swamp cabbage and whatnot. But I really learned how to cut swamp cabbage from my good friend, Cliff Berg. Uh, who he's another old cracker. <laughs> um, but I, I tried to learn something every day and you alluded to it earlier about, I, I, we've been doing, you know, you and I, we've been hunting and or hunting. I know I've been hunting and fishing my whole life, but it doesn't matter if someone's only been doing it for a little while, they may see things from a different perspective Absolutely. and actually have a new take on it. And you're like, that's really cool right there. You know? Because we we look through our glasses that we've been seeing the world in our way. But every day I'm dealing with someone, talking with someone, having a conversation with somebody. I, I try to learn something every, every day. And, you know, my mom says, boy, you got a mind like a steel trap. You know, <laughs> I remember things and I, you know, it's applied knowledge. If I do this here, then all of a sudden you'll be doing something over here and you're like, oh, that'll work right there. And 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 those could be, I mean, I don't know if you do this in your in your thing, but I'll read business books that help me with fishing. I will read some other kind of book that helps me with something else because you're taking these concepts and you're like, huh, that's interesting how how he thinks about that. And mm-hmm. what if I did that over here? Would that work? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a massive failure, <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth a try, you know? And, uh, do you, do you try to apply those different things? Like the things that you're learning on the land, do you try to apply know. those to parenting? Do you try to apply those to business? Do you try to apply those in different places? Because the natural world is a great teacher, I think. hundred <laughs> percent. So I can tell you this, I don't read any book. Like, I don't read any books. I, I, I read about a chapter out of my Bible every day. That's just what I've been doing my whole life. Um, but I learn a lot in the wild. So I'll tell you this, and, and I try to apply this all the time. So we have 3,000 acres just to the north here. That's our ranch. And if you have a crackhead doe, she will raise a crackhead fawn. <laughs> and what I mean by that, we call crackheads does that just are panic-stricken, paranoid, blow at everything, stomp at everything, run around, just they stress out everything else on the land and their fawns will grow up exactly like them. Mm-hmm. But then you have a good old doe that is just an a awesome doe and she's smart. She's smart as a tack, you know, and she, she's calm and she's smart and she just takes her time. She will raise a fawn the exact same way. And so with my children, you know, your dad, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got yeah. three kids. Yeah. So twenty year old, eighteen year old, and a fourteen year old girl. Dude, what stress can a, a child? I mean, I mean, it can be terrifying and stressful, and but you know, I always think about them old does that are always calm and collected and smart, watching what's going on. They raise their children the same way, and so I, you know, I think the most important job in the world that I have or any parent has is raising your children and taking care of your family. And uh, so I always try to remember the old doe that's calm, collected, keeps everything under control. 
because that's the way I want my kids to grow up. And you see that the that the one that stomps and and blows and stuff like that either gets taken down or <laughs> gets makes a shot mistake. A lot. <laughs> they get shot, gets coyote, yeah. gets something. Right? I mean, yeah. and that's that's the that's the lesson. But there's so many lessons from 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 nature that I'm sure that you're you're bringing into your mm-hmm. to your your family. So tell me about your family. How many kids do you have? I've got two children. I've got Aria is my two year old daughter, and Emma is almost nine months old. And my wife is Sarah. She's uh, awesome. I mean, she's just an amazing mom. She's an amazing wife. Super, super good girl. And uh, she's taken a huge sacrifice with being a mom because she's like the one of the most avid outdoorsmen you'd ever meet. I mean, hunting, fishing, diving. First day I ever took her snorkeling, she jumped in the water like she'd been doing it her whole life. She can like legitly go free dive 30, 40 feet like like no problem. And she grew up in Wisconsin. Um, but she is so dedicated and passionate about being a mom. And to me, that's, that's the most beautiful thing ever. And, you know, as the girls are almost big enough where, where we can do bigger and better things yeah. or yeah. ask my mom or her mom, like, Hey, you think you want good for a little bit? We're going to slip off and do this, mm-hmm. you know, but, but she's really been, She's been an amazing. It's it's amazing so, uh, to watch her. How does a guy like you find time to get out of the woods or the water long enough to meet a girl like that? Ah, uh, that's a pretty cool story. I was I was I guide a lot of alligator hunts, and so if it weren't for alligator hunting, I would have went broke, man. <laughs> when it, when the economy turned bad and whatnot, people still wanted to go gator hunting, and and just when I was at my wits end, someone would call and book a gator hunt, which was always that was a blessing. And uh, the owners of AMS Bow Fishing contact me and said hey we'd like to go on a couple alligator hunts so yeah sure they come down tough hunt but we caught uh the first night we caught like an 11.5 or 11.6 nice gator and we took a bunch of pictures and they were uploading it on facebook so we became friends well she was on their pro staff in wisconsin mm-hmm. as a bow fisherman and so i i get this friend request from this beautiful blonde haired girl i'm like well I hope she's a real human because she sure is pretty. (laughs) And uh, so I started stalking her, you know, poaching through her, through her photos and sent her a little message. And we started talking. And 10 days later, I said, you know, I want to go look at a piece of property in Iowa. She goes, well, fly into Madison. I'll pick you up and we'll drive over there. So 10 days later, flew to flew to Wisconsin. We spent the weekend together. She quit all her jobs. We started traveling all over the country deer hunting, and she moved to Florida having never seen it. Wow. You know, I, she tells her mom and dad, hey, I'm gone. I'm going to Florida. They thought she was crazy and uh, came down. And Did she make that decision in February? Uh, she made it like, <laughs> I mean, we met in October by November. She was like, I'm going to Florida. It hadn't even gotten really cold yet. No, I was no, thinking no. February might no, be no, like no. It was, the peak of winter. I'm going to Florida. <laughs> it was immediate and without hesitation. She came down here and has embraced the Florida life. Like just, I mean, she, she knows it so well, whether we're out on the buggy, on the ranch. Um, she has a channel called Dear Mom that, hmm. you know, she sort of vlogs and shows the kids and, and whatnot. But she's, man, you're, you'll see her out in a boat crabbing lobster and whatever she's she's wide open full nice. throttle and so um we raised three kids in key west and we had no family support is she is she having any issues with that with her family being back or is her family back in wisconsin mm-hmm. her family's in wisconsin uh but her mom and dad her mom is down right now visiting and her mom and dad are still married as well my mom and dad are still married they live about a mile and a half from us and uh, so my mom comes over all the time, and and uh, so we do have some, we do have plenty of support. Mm-hmm. But Sarah, Sarah, you know, she's pretty hardcore. She has some kids with her all the time, and uh, you know, she does take them over to my mom and whatnot. But uh, she's a she's a good mom. That's that's a good thing. I I have uh, a similar similar wife with uh, man. She took good care of our kids, and and we made. Big sacrifices to to make sure that she could stay home with them, and uh, one of the best, probably one of the best decisions that we've ever made together was to to do whatever it took to make sure that she could stay with the kids, because a lot of kids these days are not getting that. Yeah, that's a huge problem, man. Yeah, huge. Yeah. So, uh, so what's uh, tell me about deer meat for dinner? 
uh, because I know that when I first met you, you may not remember this, but a long time ago we met at ICAST and you had something going called Respect Outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. Uh, and then that, what happened? It came and went well, or what? Yeah. What's so the story there? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not too familiar. I, I don't know how well your audience understands the whole time by concept on TV. You know, oh, let's go in and buy airtime. Let's tell them. Yeah. So TV, outdoor TV, although it's pretty much run its course and is dying on the vine as we speak. Uh, over the past decade or more, go in to a channel like Sportsman Channel or Outdoor or whatnot, and you buy your time slot. And you buy your commercial space and then you produce a show and go out and sell your sponsor, your commercial ads and pay your airtime and then pay your production and pay all this, that, and the other, and then try to keep a little bit left over. That's your profit. Well, I went out and I had a, respect outdoors was exactly what deer meat for dinner is. It was just me out doing what I do, hunting, fishing, mm -hmm. cooking. It was mm -hmm. exactly the same thing. Although YouTube has brought out a lot more just spontaneous realness because I can do so many more of them. I'm not doing 13 or 26 yeah. episodes. I, I do two or three or four a week. And um, it, it's just much more natural. But the concept was the same with respect outdoors. And all of a sudden, me and Sarah get together and I'm talking with the networks about what my contract's going to, how much I was going to owe them for airtime. I'm thinking, man, every time I get a new sponsor, it seems like my airtime goes up equivalent uh, I'm, yeah. I'm like i'm making no money i'm working around the clock and i'm broke is the 10 commandments and so i was i was sitting in my kitchen cooking deer meat a cast iron skillet with a couple back straps sliced up and i was th thinking okay I, I can't do this what am i going to do and a good friend of mine greg mutsanides greg if you hear this podcast i love you brother and you mean the world to me mm -hmm. um he's like man you need to do youtube that's where it's all going you gotta do youtube and i thought he was crazy but i started looking at it and i said all right i'm gonna start a youtube channel i said so what am i what am i gonna call this thing i said what do i really love in this world as i'm cooking a cast iron skillet full of deer meat i'm like well heck i like deer meat that's for sure and i said tell you the truth. And I'm talking out loud to myself. I said, tell you the truth. I, I really like deer meat for dinner. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just totally joking with myself. And I, I look on my phone, deermeatfordinner.com and it's available. I'm like, Oh man. I'm like, Hey honey, you got any, you got any space on your credit card? She goes a little bit. I said, well, I need to use it. I'm going to buy a, I'm going to buy a, a domain name. And she's like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like, nah, no, nah, I think this would be cool. Deermeatfordinner.com. That sounds awesome. Huh? And so we just started going, started going, started going and making videos. And it took a couple of years. Now I was doing other things, guiding gator hunts. Then I got into being a captain again, running a big sport fishing boat and but started moving things along and it started to grow and grow and grow. And once we started picking up steam, I remember laying there in bed, talking with Sarah going, honey, we, this ain't a joke. We have a, this is bigger than TV ever was. This is what TV, what, I, this is what I dreamed TV would be. Yeah. And so now we've embraced it. And over the past year, we've gone full-time into YouTube and it's just exploded in, in opportunity. And, um, but again, I try to live for today. You know, I'm only word, ask me what I'm going to do the rest of the day. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to do. All I know is I'm going to do this with you today. Once I get done with that, then I'll say, all right, now what's next? But I'm only, I'm very focused on one thing at one time and and um and that's how jeremy for dinner is i'll look around at the weather well looks pretty good it is pretty calm out right now you could run out go fishing in in the ocean or i don't want to be on the ranch because there's no wind and to be hot as blue blazes so everything that i do is based on the weather and how i feel at that moment yeah and you you are equipped um you're we're we're sitting right here in jupiter which man I don't know how <laughs> how I missed this place for a long time, but over the past few years, you know, I came up here and fished with Ryan Nitz. He introduces me to the place. I see this amazing snook fishery that you have. Then um, just recently, we shot over to the Bahamas. We come back. That's what I'm doing on this trip. And I'm like, Jupiter's right there. Again, here's Jupiter. I come through here. Black Tip H is here, you're here, Ryan Nitz is here, Davis Bennett is here, all of these people that I know are here, these cool people. You've got this 3,000-acre ranch in, in here. You're, you're 
hog hunting and deer hunting and doing all this cool stuff. And uh, I, I seriously don't know how I missed Jupiter. I went right past it to Key West and never stopped. But this place is amazing. Takes, I mean, yeah. it Takes. is amazing. Take Jupiter. Let's use the lighthouse, for example. Go to lighthouse and take a string and go out 100 miles and do a circle around it. Yeah. And see what you can do. Well, that's like that's like what I always say about Yellowstone National Park. It's like people are like, "Where's the best trout fishing in the world?" I'm like, 200 mile <laughs> radius around Yellowstone <laughs> National Park. You just you just stay in that circle and don't leave, and you're going to be fine. You, there will, you'll never run out of things to do. And that's that's very similar to this, and also very similar to like Key West or or Duck Key or something like that. And the you know if you do that, you got all the Everglades. You got all the offshore. And there are very few places like that. Louisiana is a place like that where you have this amazing offshore fishing, the amazing inshore fishing, the amazing hunting, the amazing freshwater fishing, the amazing opportunities around there. Uh, I guess North Carolina kind of comes to mind or Maryland is another place kind of like that. But they're few and far between. And even in Maryland, the, the, the run offshore is so huge. Mm-hmm. But here... Man, this this world that has opened for me now at the, in the Bahamas of just realizing, you know, when you're in Key West, the Bahamas seems like you might as well go to Christmas Island. You might as well go to Canada. I mean, it just seems like a long way away. Right. And but but we did it, and we run across and have an amazing experience over there. Bahamas. I mean, I'd been to the Bahamas bone fishing and stuff like that, but never in our own boat, never doing things like that. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's awesome. The people are fantastic it's a it's a it's an another like a, a foreign experience the you're in a foreign country there's different currency there's different food there's different people there's different dialects there's different everything i loved it mm-hmm. and you've got all of that here so you're equipped to do so many things from from here and i'm assuming you've got boats you've got cars you got swamp buggies you've got uh, what, how, how are you equipped? Yeah, tell me man, about your, tell me about your, uh, oh, you know, it's, uh, that's, it's kind of humbling to think, you know, we have a big tour RV, big old huge RV that's all wrapped out in deer meat for dinner. I saw, you a, know? Picture, I saw a picture of that. You still have that? Oh yeah, man. I'm not getting rid of that thing. And, uh, then we have a real cool buggy. I literally rebuilt the buggy and a Rambo at the exact same time. So we complete, and they what's both- a Rambo? That. That. Okay. The boat boat. right behind us. That 27 Rambo. Okay. And I've taken that to the Bahamas over 60 times. Back and forth. Nice. Just running over. I mean, you want to talk about being spontaneous? I will jump on the boat right now and shoot over there with not even think about it. E-perb in hand. Roll. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I'm very spontaneous. I have the boat. I have the buggy. uh, Got the RV. I got a camp. My camp is totally off the grid run strictly on generator power um you know me and my wife both drive chevy silverados and uh we're building a new home out in jupiter uh, well i'm building a phone okay everyone it's, it's in jupiter farms you're wondering where it is i kind of let that one flip <laughs> stalkers um, yeah um we're building a new home right now and uh it's been in like a newfound thing pretty much Everywhere we go now, we have fans. It's, yeah. It doesn't matter if it's in the hospital or Publix or everywhere you go or driving down the road, there's people, our fans, and that's such an honor, you know, and, and it's sort of, it's a new, it's a new reality of how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, I try to spend time with everyone. Sarah's like, we can't spend an hour with every single person <laughs> that says hello, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. And so I just try to utilize my gear my 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 tools and my ability to bless a lot of other people i'm i'm getting ready to start this thing where i just roll up wherever the jetty hey what are you doing you catch any fish no you want to let's get on the boat let's go because you, those are people you can learn so much from mm-hmm. you know they're out there on that jetty or out on that bridge or just want to go do something yeah what and, are they doing yeah who are they yeah why why are I mean, this is their time. This is what they choose to do. They're out there by themselves. It's an interesting story on every one of those people. Absolutely. And so the more time I can spend with people like that, doing things like that, you know, the you know better. What, you know what'll be really cool is when you roll up to somebody on that bridge and you're like, hey, man, I got a live well full of bait. Mm-hmm. Uh, come on, get in. And he's like, dude, why would I want to go over there? <laughs> and you're like, hold on a second. Hold on well, a second. We're what, fish are, here. what are you doing? And he's like, 
I'll tell you what. Why don't you come up here and let me show you how I'm catching these these giant snook underneath this bridge. They're giant snook under that bridge? What? I didn't know that. Yeah. And he's like, uh, yeah, why don't you leave your camera in the car? Because I don't want everyone else to know about it. And then that's that white belt mentality. You that's learn. Ryan Nitz. What, the person you just, ex who you just ex uh, explained is Ryan Nitz. Yeah. Like that joker has scales. Yes. He is proper. I and, love Ryan Nitz. Yeah, he's a little clown. Yeah, he's... Uh, one one of my favorite um, guest shows that that we've ever done, and we don't do a lot of guest shows because, you know, I mean, you're doing this. I get it. The the whole uh, crew, the 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 next person that comes in, especially sports stars or something like that. There are tons of people I would like to invite on the show, tons of them. But when I contact them, they have this window of, well. Could, can we get it done in 12 hours? Um, maybe, you know, but then we end up with a half finished show and it's no good. It never sees the light of day. So honestly, we've stayed away from guests, but Ryan, you know, this world of Instagram, and I've talked about this a bunch of times and it's how, how I found you, how I found Ryan, how I found Davis Bennett, Black Tip H. Uh, my friend Graham Taylor, uh, my friend uh, Melton Hill Bill, all of these people that have turned into fishing and hunting buddies. Then I'm looking through Instagram like, this guy likes to do the same kind of stuff I do. Man, I'd like to learn how to cut off hog balls like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go cut one then. <laughs> I'm all about it. I, I want to talk about that because I was, I was watching that. And I, I got to tell you, I've never cut hog balls off. But so I want to, I want to know about that because we don't have, like I spent a lot of time in Tennessee and the hogs haven't made it up there. So I don't have experience with hogs. I didn't grow up with hogs. I don't know anything about it. A little further south, those guys have a lot of experience with hogs, but I don't. So one of the videos that I like of yours is making a boar a bar. Mm -hmm. So explain that to me. Like what, what happens there? A wild pig wild has balls. Yeah. They're a, they're a boar. Mm -hmm. That's right. Why do you want to make them a bar? Well, so take our ranch, for example. We have to manage the hog population. And I don't want to just randomly go out and kill 100 boar hogs and throw them away because they stink terribly. Okay, so that's, that's, where, the, that's where the confusion with me lies. The, the wild boar is so lean. It's just very... It, look, imagine what you smell like if you were fired up like beyond life and hadn't worn deodorant a day in your That's life. That's right after workout. Yeah, but you've never <laughs> worn deodorant a day in your right. life and it's and you don't take showers mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And they, you're rolling mud and and you yeah, and your shit. whole life is about beating up other boar hogs and breeding as many sow hogs as you possibly can. That's a boar hog and they are vile. I mean, they'll stink up your whole house. Mm -hmm. Now you can kill a small boar is hog. Is the meat good though? If you were to if you were to go through the process of cleaning it, is it edible? Not, not a big, not one. that no, much. No, not a big okay. one. But now on the flop side, if I take my dogs out or if I set a trap and I catch a boar hog, in in a minute I can cut him. It's it's a very small incision. Grab them, and they're big. You know, a good sized boar hog. His old gonads would be as big as a grapefruit. Yeah, grapefruit. Yeah, or a a big big lemon. You know, yeah. like a big old lemon for sure take it make a small incision in it and each each one of them will be in their own little sack over here you know and make your first cut pull it tight make your second cut pop it out and rip it off you don't want so the ripping it off that's what i noticed there and there i was waiting for you to cut no but you didn't it cut yeah right you so you it, just you just squeeze that out and just went like this and it's gone pull it right off and it'll go like it'll, velcro like uh no uh i'm thinking like pulling a pulling a key lime uh, off a tree, yeah. But think so the the vessels and whatnot that they have in there. If you just pull it off, if you rip it off, they'll they'll pull tight. And literally, when they pull and they get tight and they don't bleed, like literally, when you cut, yeah, him you right, showed that on your on your video. It was cool. There's no blood anywhere, and they within all the time I catch the same boar. So I catch him in the trap, cut him, let him go. And I'll catch that joker again. I've caught one five times. Every time I set the trap, I catch the same bar that I've already cut out of that trap. So now once he's cut, immediately has they immediately stop looking for sow hogs. Um, I don't know if I can say it, but I always you say. You can say anything. I say they stop chasing ass and start eating grass. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, um, but, uh, you know, uh, a boar hog will have a big shield. It's, uh-huh. it's called a dermal layer. It's actually bone growing into their skin and it's, it's a shield. It's crazy. Um, they'll lose that once they have, once they lose that, the, the hormone, They'll lose their shield. Really? They'll put on a layer of fat, and they go from being the worst eating wild game in the world to the best eating wild game really? in the world. Take a 200-pound bar that's got an inch of fat on him. The meat is better than any store-bought pork you'll ever, ever see. Well, I can believe that. I'm not a big fan of store-bought pork. I just, I mean, bacon. Who doesn't like bacon? Yeah. But- Calm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Communist. That's exactly right. Bacon <laughs> is the candy of meats. That is uh, that's awesome. And you can buy store bought. You can buy you this whatever. Ba- all bacon is good. Right. Uh, we agree there right. perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, I, I I think that pigs and and hogs are interesting because I've heard other people talk about you take a domesticated pig and you let it go out into the wild and they change into a hog. Well, do yes. they? What's your experience with that? So, and, and I can show you some really, like, on our ranch, I could show you some really good wild hogs that are, they got a big, long nose, big, flat forehead, super big shoulders, real small, tiny hams, small rear ends, and they're just bad dudes. They're wild. Now, you take a, a domesticated just a domesticated hog, turn him loose. He may get mean, he may get angry, but it's still going to be a rounded off. Yeah. I mean, it's like the guy that hadn't worked out until he's 60 and, <laughs> and he might get there. <laughs> you know, You're doing good, with a lot You're of hard good. work, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he's still going to be kind of rounded off. Right. But, but, but the, the thing that I was hearing about is that they go from being this, this pink, almost hairless deal to going out they do, they start growing different hair they start you no, don't see that that's not true that's not true no that that hog's going to have that hair however that's that's how he is his personality might change in a while but he's not going to change his his characteristics aren't going to change mm-hmm. that's that's a fact but but a pig doesn't go to a hog i mean a domesticated well, pig that gets loose isn't going to turn into turn some in. semblance of that no okay no uh, are the other are those wild hogs going to just beat the crap out of him when he gets out there? Mm, yeah, but me and my little brother Gabe, I have one it's one story about this. Out in when we fifteen years ago, me and my brothers we hog hunted all the time with our dogs. Gabe had a dog named Red Rock. I had Spot, two proper dogs, um, good sight hunting dogs. There's a the hog, turn him loose, pow, catch him. <laughs> guy calls us from like a development out here in Loxahatchee. He goes, yeah, we got a hog out here messing with our horses and whatnot. And so he gives us the address. We drive out there. I'm like, dude, you're, you're like in the middle of a development. He goes, yeah, the hog, there's a, there's a lot down there. Hog walks down this road, goes into our horse pasture there and fights with our horses and eats all the horse. I'm like, dude, there ain't no way. He goes, yeah, he'll be here at five o'clock today. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm going to bring my little brother. We're going to check this out. So we got five o'clock. Here comes this big old white boar hog walking down the road. Boom, boom, boom. I'm like, you want to see how we fix him? <laughs> <laughs> the game's holding Red Rock. I'm holding spot. Giddy boy. That, that hog beat the, beat the brakes off both our dogs and ran right back into them woods where he came from. We went and got other dogs. And we never found that hog again. Never. Wow. And me and my brother, we've caught thousands of hogs. Me and Gabe still talk about that hog to this day. Like that's your two white of the whale, baddest b- catch dogs you've ever seen. Got their eyes beat shut by this hog, and he walked off. Like, don't mess with me, guys. And so, but he looked like a domesticated hog that went wild. Yeah. So, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just not likely that you turn an old domesticated hog loose and he becomes a serious wild hog. Yeah. Um, but if you take a, a domesticated sow and she's going to get bred by a wild boar hog, then her, her piglets will look more and more wild. Mm. And then those piglets mm. will get bred with wild and it'll be more and more wild. Yeah. You know, so. Now, what if you took a, what if you took a, a bar and you put him in a pen and you feed him what the other hogs do? Is he going to become more and more domesticated that while he's alive, not his offspring, but that particular hog, 
you get him out of the woods, you get him out of the, eating the wild stuff, you put him on the, the standard feed or whatever you're feeding the, the pigs. Is he going to undergo a change? This is what this is what change he would undergo. He would probably settle down a little bit because he's a bar. He's going to settle down. He would definitely put on a lot of weight, but he would probably lull you to sleep. All of a sudden, <laughs> one day you'd say, oh, man, old pork chop, you're doing so good. <laughs> You jump in there to give him to pet him on the head, and he'd cut your leg wide open and throw you out of the pen. That's it just what never would never leaves. That that instinct never leaves. They ain't leaving. Not happening. It's now not. I cut I cut a little boar hog in my trap. You know, two three months ago, I caught him. He was so small. His his gonads weren't as big as a big pea. You know, <laughs> cut him out. I've caught him several times since, and every time I catch him in the trap, he's like, "How's it going?" <laughs> Corn, it's just me. More, yeah, we're good. Just me. He doesn't even squeal around. I grab him, set him out of the trap. I'm like, dad gum it. So I'm gonna put a tag in his ear so no one kills him. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool hog. That's cool. Let's talk about gator hunting, man, because uh, you extre- you have a, a an amazing amount of gator experience, right? Yes, sir. Gators and how do you, are... how do you how do you become a gator guide? Well, you just I got to give a shout out to uh, Brad Gibson, Lee Lightsey, Wade Lightsey, guys that I really started hunting with guys that were i was still in tv then and i knew it was some cool shows i had gator hunted just not properly before then and so then come along the public hunt which is from august 15th november 1st we went out did some hunts and i saw right away i was like oh man i i have enough fishing experience i i thought i'm built for this and so i started getting my own tags and started hunting a lot and then I had people all over that would see my pictures and say, hey, we want to go. And I say, well, let's book a trip. And so as all, everything with TV completely died and then the economy dropped out, I had no money. Then I, was, I had enough experience and enough clients that I could sell 30, 40, 50 hunts. And, um, and where do you do these? Anywhere. So in Florida, they have a lottery system and there's, uh, there's probably a thousand different zones um pretty much every body of water will have tags allocated for it and uh you go through the lottery process whatever you get awarded are your tags now it's also i do some things here so like let's say i sell 50 hunts but i only have my two tags then i'll go out and find other people who have tags in that area and I'll pay them for their time and pay them for their tags. They have to go with you. They have to ride okay. along with yep. me. And my clients get what's called an alligator trapping agent license. Totally legal, 100% by the books. And we'll go out, catch the gators, kill the gators, tag the gators. And once they're tagged, they're my client's gator. So it's uh, it works real well. There's a variety of different ways. Uh, sometimes we'll hunt them with a crossbow with a with a line attached to it and a float. Sometimes we'll use bow and arrows. Sometimes we'll throw a snatch hook. Uh, sometimes we'll drop a bait, although the bait cannot have a hook in it. And uh, there's just... So they'll just hold on to the bait like a blue crab and you just bring them up and then shoot them? <laughs> no, uh, they'll swallow the bait. And then a lot of times a big gator's going to go into deep water. A small gator's going to bury up in the willows and whatnot. And uh, you'll sort of get around to them, figure out if he's you know, the gator you want. And, uh, if he's a big gator, ease him up. I'll put a hook into him or a harpoon dart into him and, uh, kill the gator, which I made it sound very simple. There's a lot of of work that goes into that. But, uh, Sarah and I, we've done it uh, piles and piles (laughs) of times. Every hunt is different. Every night is different. And, um, it is, I've taken a lot of, you know, it's not a cheap hunt. It's a pretty expensive hunt. And I've taken people that have hunted all over Africa and all over Southeast Asia. And they're like, this was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. So you're just going out in like a John boat? No, no. We have a 24 foot skiff that's custom made. It's built specifically for it because lights. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm very into complete darkness with a very, very dim light. I'm all about very dim. So on every body of water that you'll ever see somewhere from that body of water, you'll see a street light, or if it's super dark, you'll see a star. I want my light to be so dim that it appears to be a street light or a light in the distance. It makes a lot of sense. Although it's actually me being very close to them. Um, And I mean, I could, we could talk for two days about gator hunting, but it, well, I don't know anything about it. I want to do it. And what made me want to do it 
the most is watching you skin the gator and using every piece of meat and seeing the carcass when it's done. And the ribs, like, that's what really, I was like, man, I want to do that. Well, you're not going to have to wait long. We'll apply for tags and we'll hunt this year. Let's do it. Uh, because I got two boys that huh, crazy yeah, about easy. hunting. But um, I want to do that because I love eating stuff mm. like there's certain things i love duck hunting i mean i love duck hunting it is really fun you don't like i don't duck like to meat. eat them yeah and so it kind of you know i'll choke them down <laughs> you know but oh, i love eating i love hunting something that is really good to eat i love fishing for something that is really good to fish for and that's the thing with fishing is eh, if you don't want to eat it you just throw it back right and it swims off and everybody's good for the but but in the hunting there is there's this finality and then it's like if i'm not going to eat it then it just took something out of out of this whole thing for me um and it's you know i'll have a party and everybody can come over and we'll have the 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 bacon wrapped duck and and you know you're an awesome cook and i want to talk about your cooking but um maybe you can tell me how to cook a duck to where it tastes better but duck and geese both i have just i mean i've tried a lot of different recipes Pretty much tastes like bacon with something in the middle that you don't really want to eat. I'd just rather eat the bacon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, keys, to, keys to cooking duck are, A, clean. A lot of people will let the, you know, duck's insulated, so he's got a lot of heat wrapped up inside yeah, yeah. his body. So they'll let him sit on the front of their boat until 2 in the afternoon. So they're, they're you've already heard him that way. Even if it's cold? Because, like, where we're hunting, it's very cold. Like Okay, so you're ice. in Arkansas yeah. or something. Okay. Even still, you'd be amazed how warm they are in the inside. Mm -hmm. We hunt here in Florida, so it'd be 85 degrees on right. a good morning. Uh, not quite that warm, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, clean your ducks as soon as you can. Put them in a good saltwater ice bath. The The saltwater ice bath will cool them down real nice. That that The salt will start to extract some of the blood out of them. But the key is to make a really good brine. Your brine. So you can take fresh herbs, honey, cinnamon sticks, salt, black pepper, uh, boil that down, uh, a lot of brown sugar. You're going to make this beautiful brine and then get the brine out. Let them, let the brine cool down. Throw them, throw all your, like in Arkansas, wherever you are, take all your duck breasts, man, make you a big, huge brine. And as you're killing all your ducks, just keep throwing them, mm -hmm. them breasts mm -hmm. in your brine and just let them sit in there for a day, two, three days. And they'll start taking on the flavors of the brine hmm. and so instead of it having that liver type flavor yeah, yeah. and that chalk right. it'll start having a much more eloquent and hmm. robust flavor a couple you know. days in that brine yeah. now somebody told me a recipe about duck and it was similar that you marinate them in kerosene and then you flambe them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah there you go yeah <laughs> um so you're how did you become the cook the chef that you are, is this out of necessity? Is this trained? Is this, what is this? Necessity because is the mother of all invention. That's right. I, 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 I reverse engineer everything. I'll see something or I'll get an idea and then I figure out how to make the idea. I'll see some, I'll see a picture something. Or if I'm in a restaurant and I taste something, I'm like, crap. Now I got to figure out how do they get that? Hmm. Someone made it. Right. Someone made that. Yeah. So I got to figure out now how I can make that. And I used a lot of Everglades seasoning. That that's pretty made. That'll help anyone be a better chef or cook. Um, and it, it goes back whenever I the first mate job I ever had. I was working for a captain named Captain Rusty Nixdorf on the Speed Merchant, and we we're going over to the Bahamas, Blue Marlin fishing. And he says, "Go over to Grand Slam, pick up a case of mullet, and this, that, and the other split tail mullets." I show up to Grand Slam. You know, I'm the young kid, and uh, how old? Uh, twenty, and. Before then, I was, you know, I, I, that was my first real sport. Fi I had been on some other little sport fishing. That was my first sport fishing job. And Rusty was a serious captain that would not take any lip <laughs> at all. <laughs> he hit you with a gaff upside the head. And uh, so he tells me to go down and pick up a case of, of split tail mullets, mackerels, this, that, and the other. And they were like, yeah, it's, I don't even remember how much. Let's say it was 500 bucks for that case of mullet. I'm like, no, dude, I don't want anything rigged. I just want mullet they're like yeah that's what they are they're seven dollars and fifty cents each i'm like huh hmm, all right that's an idea go back to rusty i said cap if i catch all the mullet and 
figure out how to make them split tail mullets. Uh, you pay me. Uh huh. He goes, if they're as good as those, I'll pay you. I'm like, hot diggity. Came out here, started firing a net, catching silver mullets, brine them up. Took me probably 10 or 15 baits to really figure out how to split the, you know, split the tail perfect, cut the rib cage out, break the backbone, make the notch in the head, pull it, pull it all out. Once I got them flat, heck, man, then on I was the one catching all the mullet. Right. And um, it's a lot of money for a 20 year old. Yeah. You know, you make an extra two, three, four hundred bucks here and there. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. And so that's like how my life has been. How do you figure out, oh, well, if I can do that, make a little bit of extra money, or if I want to go on this trip, or if I want to go do all this, my job now pays my bills and pays this, that, and the other. But if I want something extra, I got to do side jobs. And I got that from my dad. Like my dad is a, a subcontractor. He owns big Bobcat business and um, he and my brother have it together. And I always, dad was always about his side jobs. Side jobs paid for all our vacations hmm. and paid for all of our extra stuff. And side job was extra work that you did to make extra money to do extra things. And so now uh, it's, um, oh, we're building a new home. That means I've got to start adding in extra videos. I got to do extra work to pay for extra things. And people that, that feel entitled to everything, like, oh, I should just have this. I don't relate with them at all because we aren't entitled to much in this world other than the opportunity to breathe and work and get out there and earn it. And so, and I tried to show that on my channel. I'm, I don't want anything for free. I want to earn what I've got. And you know, yeah, that's a great attitude. And one that's one that's rare in this, in this world. Um, well, it's not rare in this world. It's rare today with some people. Yes, sir. But the uh, the hard work and dedication, I, I, I like I like that story because with those side jobs and with the mullet comes the understanding of where those mullet live, comes the understanding of then if they're mullet, there's probably snook, maybe tarpon. That's then you are you are while you're doing the offshore fishing, you're learning the inshore fishing because if you know the bait, you know the fish. I mean, Correct. is that is that a, a, a ancillary benefit to that that you learned later that you found later? Like I know where the bait is all, all along. I've I've all. Where do you find hungry people? <laughs> At restaurants and grocery stores. Yeah. Okay. So if I was trying to catch a hungry human, I'd go sit up in front of you know Jetty's restaurant on the river there, or I'd go sit out in front of uh I'd go drag a dredge out in front of Publix, you yeah. know, with hot dogs. <laughs> but um. <laughs> Uh, you want to find fish, find bait. So go hunt bait. You know, if you're out there fishing offshore and you're not marking bait anywhere, you're probably not going to catch right. anything. You know, you understand? Unless you've got all the bait with you and you can create a bait. But <laughs> then uh, you're doing something special. Um, but uh, I spend a lot of time in the water. Free diving has been a huge part of my life. And so the more time I'm in the water, watching what fish are doing in the water and how they react in the water really helps you when you're out of the water. Mm -hmm. Um, the cooking cooking is just a, I do not want to kill anything. I can't eat, you know, a, a deer are too beautiful. If I didn't love, I would say deer meat is like, I don't know my favorite food in the world. I just love deer meat. Like I just am addicted to it. More I, so than, I mean, you have some elk experience, right? I've, yeah, I've killed elk. I do like elk. Um, but deer meat, that's it. I, am, I just love, man, a good, like my mom, whenever I was a kid, I always hunted out in the backwoods. It was about a quarter mile, half mile to the Southeast of our house. I hunted with a BB gun. I'd kill every squirrel, <laughs> dove, quail, anything I could find with that BB gun, but I'd bring them back to the house, clean them up. We'd freeze them. And when I got enough to make a big pot of food, we'd make a big pot of food. But anytime I was out there, our, our predominant wind is out of the Southeast. If I could smell her pan frying deer meat, it was like, ooh, heaven tonight. Go home. <laughs> She'd just take it, you know. Hunt's over. Yeah, we're going home, <laughs> boys. She'd salt and pepper it, roll it in flour, and uh, pan fry it in a little, either bacon grease or oil or whatnot. And it just tasted different when she did it. And to this day, if I go over and she's cooking dinner, and just, I I'm like, there's just nothing in the world that tastes better to me than mama's pan fried deer meat, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so I love, 
I think it's a lot about respect to the animal. When I catch a fish, a lot of people, uh, especially that don't know any better, you know, they catch a fish, there's a cooler full of ice there, they just throw the fish in on the ice, he's flopping around on a bunch of ice cubes, and it really doesn't do much, you know, make a nice ice brine, throw the fish in on the ice brine, locks them up really quick, cools them to the core, come home, take a really good sharp flay knife, make perfect cuts, and now you have fish that was caught, well taken care of, cleaned perfectly, and now I have now I have a canvas. Okay, so now I take the canvas back to the kitchen and make some kind of artistic painting, mm-hmm. and and it's just it's about full circle. Well, let me ask you that: is that because when you're talking about this, there's this passion of the whole process? Is there one part of that process that you are enjoying more than the other? No, sir. That's what I thought. No, sir. That's what I thought, and that's what comes through in your video. And I don't know if you mean for it to, or or but but. The way that you're talking about that is about the whole process. It's about catching the bait. It's about, and and catching the bait is just as much fun as now you're moving out to wherever you're going to fish. And now you found the fish and that's exciting. And now you, you bait the bait, you throw it out there, you catch the fish. That's exciting. But then there's this whole, oh, I've gonna, and I'm gonna take care of it perfectly, and it's going right in this ice bath, and it's gonna be perfect, and then we're gonna go hard. You know what I'm gonna do with this? And it, that is very similar to my friend Scott Walker, who's the host of Into the Blue. And when he catches something, he's he's already like, it's already turning. He's like, I got some cracker crumbs for you, yeah, and yeah, I got yeah, this, yeah, yeah, and yeah. my green egg is. I'm gonna call my wife, and she's gonna start the green <laughs> egg, and it's like all in there. And he's he knows he's got it all going. He's like Saturday day is your day, buddy. And <laughs> I got friends coming over to watch the game and you are the star attraction. And I, I just love that. And, and somehow, like I love eating the fish and I love doing all these things, but somehow I have missed that enjoyment of actually cooking. And, and maybe that's because I married a wonderful Southern woman who loves to cook and takes care of all of us and does that. But that's that's what I think really comes through in your videos is this is this you call it you you enti- you title your videos uh, uh, catch clean cook and I think that's one of the reasons I mean do you think that that's one of the reasons why you're having such success with this channel because if it was just catch eh maybe there's right. lots of catch right. and there's there's yeah. lots of catch and maybe there's some cleaning maybe there's some cooking but the way that you're doing this of this of this and I, and I really think that's the secret to your, your success on this is that, is that you enjoy and respect and appreciate the entire process from maybe you don't like washing the dishes, but, and maybe you don't like scrubbing the boat, but from, from here to there. Have people been telling you about me? No. Okay. Well, you nailed it on the head. No, no. I, you know, and, and this is, this is one of my favorite podcasts yet because I don't really know a lot about you, but it's almost like when I met Graham Taylor and started spending time with him. And if you don't know Graham Taylor, we could be triplets. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I met him and I'm like, dang, dude, like, I think we're brothers from, from <laughs> somehow, like, I love you, man. And, and so Graham and I go fishing and we go turkey hunting and, and he's just got this unbelievable passion. And, and it's like, man, I don't hang out with a lot of people who got that same, same passion, that same deal. But, but that's one of the things that I like about this conversation is that I really don't know that much about you, but it's what you see is what you get. And you can't, you can't fake passion. You can't fake interest. You can't fake enthusiasm. You can't fake knowledge. I mean, you can't, like I'm watching you and I'm waiting when I'm watching these videos, I'm waiting for you to Nah, just not do it right. But you're cleaning a gator with the skill of someone who has cleaned thousands of gators. You're doing all of these things. That's what I was impressed with. I'm like, this guy's a real deal. Like, yeah, I don't know anything about you, but just <laughs> from the just from the videos and talking about you, I mean, you you seem like the real deal. Well, I appreciate it. There's so a lot a lot of y'all that are listening to the podcast and that watch the videos. There are things. I, I am like a very unorganized human. I have to make, I have to go to great lengths to make things easy to keep organized and to keep clean. My wife is amazing. She cleans my office for me. 
she'll clean out my truck for me. She does. I mean, I'm like I'm like the boat going down the river. I leave a wake of disastrous <laughs> mess behind me. And I know some other people like that too. <laughs> yeah. So I leave this crazy I'm and I have this thing. I leave stuff in my cooler all the time and forget about it. And she's like, Honey, I'm like, Oh God, what did I do? I know I did something. Yeah. It's, well, this will this is a this <laughs> this will sum up my friend Graham Taylor in one story. <laughs> he goes and he has taught these fish how to eat this bait and they're going to be there. And he has created this fishery out of a fishery that didn't exist before. And he does it by catching shad, taking them, transporting them. It's a massive project. He's covered in, the first time I ever meet him, he is covered in <laughs> scales, scales like the Tin Man. He looks like the Tin Man. And I'm like, Wow, I already like this guy. He's totally covered in scale. Hey, man, how's it going? I've been up since two. Uh, we're all set. Let's go. I'm like, hey, perfect. This is, and there's just this reeking of, you might as well have left the bait in the cooler overnight and opened the lid, right? And so Graham goes home to his wife and she's like, Graham, get in here. And uh, he's like, what, honey, what, what is going on? And she says, I can take a lot of things, but I can't take this. <laughs> and she pulls his blue jeans up and she goes, these went through the washing machine. Oh and there's like gosh. a pocket full <laughs> of shad. <laughs> and so that's him all the time, every 24 seven, just, just, he might have a, he might be turkey hunting and he's got a pocket full of shad. Because it's just it's it's just a constant. He's just always if he's not turkey hunting, he's he's over here looking at these fish. And if he's not doing that, he's over here looking at these deer. And if he's not doing that, maybe he's trying to hog hunt or he's trying to do this or he's getting ready to go yellowfin tuna fishing and he's just twenty four seven going, going, going. You guys remind me a lot of well, each other. Graham, wherever you are, brother, we uh, we gotta we gotta set <laughs> no, something up. We're hooking up. We're, yeah, we're gonna sure. go gator hunting. I think that's what we should do. Go Easy. gator hunting uh with Graham. That would be that would be amazing. Yeah, well we can hog hunt on the ranch beforehand. Uh we can hog hunt, have a big time there, and then in the afternoons go gator hunting. That'll be piece of cake, no worries whatsoever. And um this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it has been. I uh, I really enjoy these conversations because you know you just get to know people in the industry, and and I figure if if somebody's doing the same type of thing, chances are you're probably the same, close to the same type of person. I don't know. I don't get along with everybody, but I get along. I try to be. I mean, in this in this world, you need to try to be friends with everybody. But uh, just a couple more questions. So you look like you. Uh, you're fit, you're staying in shape. Are you doing that purposefully? Life is my gym. Is that right? Yeah. You're just hunting. See, there's Graham Taylor again. He just runs 15 miles to go check on the turkeys and, and check a, a, a trail cam, and then he's back out. That's it. You know, people are like, hey, Rob, you look like you lost a little bit of weight. Yeah, you know, life Been at is the camp. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the Bahamas. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's, you know, free diving. From now through summer, I'll free dive a lot, a lot, a lot. Free diving, you know? That'll That's do it. Constant up, down, up, down, hardcore, in, out, go, 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 go. You know, mm -hmm. uh, most people don't realize when you're on a boat a lot, your your body is shifting oh, yeah. and adjusting yeah, yeah. for weight change constantly. That's why someone new gets on the boat after, at the end of the day, they're literally like you just pulled the plug out of them. Mm -hmm. They're done. wiped out, wiped out, wiped out. And so I try to stay fit uh, mentally, physically. Um, I try very hard to separate. So YouTube is our full-time job. It's a full-time lifestyle, making videos, doing what we do. It's, and over the past few months, I've really started to make conscious efforts to turn it off at times. Hmm. Turn my phone off, hmm. put everything away. Because, you know, my daughters, Ari and Emma and, and my wife, Sarah, you only have a certain amount of time together and tomorrow's not promised to anybody. So I try to turn it off and just look at them and appreciate them for that day. Like Emma's eight months or nine months now. She, she's never going to be nine months again. I got to enjoy these days with her. You know, if I'm mm -hmm. holding her and she's looking at me, and she's got these two little cute teeth, you know, I let her bite on my fingers and tickler. And, you know, with, with Aria, I always tell her the doctor has to look for the tickle bugs, you know, and, I try to enjoy, I actually try to 
really consciously look and like, absorb those memories because they're fleeting and they're not going to last forever. And I don't want to get 10 years down the road and go, man, I wish I would have done more of that, you know? And, and Sarah, she's such an encouragement to, hey, honey, let's do this or let's do that or, you know, look at Aria looking at you. And, and so I try very hard to do my best with YouTube. But at the same time, my biggest mission in life is to be a father and a husband, you know? And so how to turn one off and to really focus on being the other. Yeah. Well, there's no better, there's no better mission in life than, than that. That's in my opinion, that's your duty as a man that has a family is to take care of that family and do the very best you can for the family. And there's a fine line and a balance between doing you know, what you need to do to take care of your family financially, right. but also to take care of your family emotionally and to be there for the support and to be there for always. And, and that's the real balance. And it's like, you start putting too much over here and this suffers. You start putting too much over here and this suffers. And it's, it takes a special person and, and it takes a special, uh, time management, I think. And what it t- turns out to me is like you, when we set this up, you were like, you a morning guy. I'm like, <laughs> if he only knew, like <laughs> that's, that's where the hours come. Right. Like you're not getting more hours later in the night. Maybe, maybe when your kids are, are your age, but when they, and, and let me tell you something, man, I got three kids. I'm a little bit ahead of you in age and, and in, and in kids, but my son's going to turn 21. Wow. My other son's going to turn eight. He just turned 18. He's getting ready to go to college. And all of a sudden, two, both are going to be gone. Um, and my daughter's 14. And I can remember you're talking about those two teeth and 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 the whole deal. And, it, and I just, when you said that, I had these flashes of every one of my kids with that same little deal. And then my oldest son, he he lost his two teeth really early. And actually, that something happened. They had to pull his front two teeth, and he didn't have two teeth for years. Like he just had this this <laughs> smile, like you That's know, awesome. all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Well, right. that happened for about five Christmases. Wow. So he had that, but I just had that flash of of all of that. Like wow, and man, I'm telling you, you you are dead on that it is fleeting. And I mean, people ask me all the time, like, how's your kid? I'm like, uh, twenty. I mean, did I just say he's twenty? Because, right. man, it seems like just exactly yesterday that, that I was doing that. But but maintain that, man, and stay on it. And I was going to ask you that, how you how you are managing that. But one thing is that you you seem to be comfortable bringing your family into the YouTube. And then that allows you to design your life to where you can be doing all of these things. So making videos doesn't necessarily mean no family time. May, you know, making three videos a week instead of two videos a week doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're away from the family. But have you, are, are you, is that a conscious decision between you and your wife that, that this, your family is going to be part of this whole person- online persona? Yeah, whenever we started, dear me, when, when it all started, it was about Sarah and I's life. And as Ari and Emma have come along, it's become about their life. And it's about our family. And that's what I think one of the biggest problems in this world right now is the the lack of family structure, the lack of solid parenting being there, the support, and I know what it's meant to me. And so I, I'll do everything in my power to have a a solid family structure in my home where we sit down and say the blessing and eat as a family and do things as a family. Uh, That's, that's number one. And, um, you know, then we have support, you know, I've, my cameraman, John McRoberts is a great guy. Uh, he's huge part of our family and does what we do and is, fits in seamlessly uh and he takes a a huge burden off of me um sometimes he buries me in footage and i tell him we don't need five hours of footage you know we need an hour of good footage yeah he's like i might miss something i'm like well don't miss anything just shoot what you got to shoot and um we uh we have a, a very brotherly type relationship banging on one another um but it all Everything goes and comes. My favorite saying with Sarah is the ocean's not always calm. Ocean's not always Mm. rough. Okay. When the ocean is rough, we look forward to the ocean being calm. When the ocean is calm, 
we're going to enjoy it and realize that it ain't going to be calm forever. So you're going to have ups and downs. If it weren't for the valleys, all the mountains would just be flat. So when you're in the valley, you can look up and you can appreciate the beauty of the mountaintop. When you're on the mountaintop, you can look down and you can see the valley and realize how far you've come and then try to be humble and appreciative of where you are and, and how you can see. You can also see where you've come and how, how many other, other people might be in valleys. And it, I'm a very emotional, emotional guy. And so I bear the burden of, of my friends and subs. You know, you hear these heart-wrenching stories. You're like, man, that gum, you know? It's tough, you know, so I try my best to do my best and and to appreciate where I am, what I have. Man, awesome, dude. I don't know if we could ever end a podcast better than that. Uh, you are, you know, I, I love it when this happens because I have I have an idea of what I'm going to encounter if I see see somebody. But one of the things that I like so much about this podcast is when are you and I ever going to have a chance to sit down for an hour and 15 minutes, one-on-one, no phones, no interruptions, whatever, to really connect? And this is how people used to connect. And this is how you connect in the deer blind. This is how you connect in the in the duck blind. Like you're sitting there talking. Nothing else is going on. And that's really missing. But honestly, man, you, uh, you're you a beast. I love it. I love your attitude. I love what you've created. I wish you all the best in it. If I can help you in any way possible, there for you. And uh, I'm going to take you up on the gator hunt. I'm bringing Graham Taylor. That's big. Bring them boys, too. <laughs> I will, buddy. Thank nice you. Thank you so much for doing this, man. It was really, really great. I know that uh, my audience is going to love it. I hope you push it out to your audience. They're going to see a different side of you, a couple stories they've never heard before. Yeah. Awesome. You're the best. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Wow. Robert Arrington. Man, that dude knows a lot of stuff. And he's very enthusiastic and grateful and thankful and... That was a great interview. Great podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. Podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. If you got other guests that you think would be as good or better than Robert Arrington as a, as a podcast guest, let me know that too. I'd love to hear if you have some suggestions like that. Robert Arrington was a suggestion from our audience. It worked out beautifully. He was an awesome guest. And I look forward to doing that alligator hunt with him bring my friend Graham Taylor down because man, those guys are like brothers. Anyway, we've got other great guests coming up. Ryan Nitz, Davis Bennett, and way, way more. So stay tuned for that. Hit subscribe, send me an email, and I'll see you on the next one.